I want all of you right now to think about your travel dream. What is your one travel dream more than all other travel dreams? The place that you dream of and hope to go to in your lifetime. For me, that place was Antarctica. It is a country that isn't really a country. It's this continent at the bottom of the world that's inaccessible, cold, and forbidding. And I think the reason I wanted to go there so badly was because I was told that it was almost impossible for someone like me to get there. You had to be an adventurer, a great explorer, or a scientist. And I was not any of those things. I was a normal person who just wanted to go to Antarctica. Now, I tried many different ways to get there. I applied for jobs. I applied for government grants. I even entered a travel contest and lost. <laughs> but something that I realized uh, is that I, you know, they, they had tours to Antarctica that I could take, and I began to look at these, but they were prohibitive. Most of the tours cost thirty or forty thousand dollars a person to be taken down to this place. And also, I didn't want to go on a tour. I wanted to go on a journey. I wanted to explore this place. Now. There's a fundamental difference between travel and tourism. They're two very different things. Tourism is a multi-billion dollar business, and it's travel that's sold as a commodity. We desire a destination, and so we pay for it, and we expect a certain experience. We expect certainty, and then we go to the place, and we have the experience. But really, you can't sell a travel experience. You can't buy the experience of a country. I'm always trying to eradicate this word "do." In English, we always say we've done something, and people talk about travel this way. I did Paris. No place is ever done, <laughs> and we can't think of it this way. Travel, real travel, is when you take to the open road and you accept everything that comes your way, be it thrilling, joyful, difficult, or depressing. This is what the original explorers did. And this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to explore. Now, I'll just show you an example. These are tours that are on sale right now for Budapest in Great Britain. And you can see the problem with tourism is that it allows the market to decide the price of an experience. This week, Budapest is very cheap. The experience of Budapest is very cheap. But we know here that that's not the case. That this is a rich experience. That it's a rich city. This is not exploration that we see here. But something that I noticed as I was dreaming of my travel to Antarctica was that if you looked at a map of the world, where I lived in Washington D.C., it was way up here, and then Antarctica was way at the bottom of the world. There was this huge, unfathomable distance. But I knew that I could get there somehow because it was on the same planet as me. It wasn't like going to the moon. And furthermore, I looked and I saw that there were roads. All of these countries in between where I lived and almost all the way to Antarctica had roads. And I figured if there were roads, then there was a way for somebody like me, a normal person without any special means or money, to get to Antarctica. And so that's what I did. I realized all I had to do was follow the same direction long enough, which in this case was south. So, I got on the bus in Washington D.C. One morning, I stood outside my office. It was New Year's Day. The city bus came by. I stepped on. I paid my fare one euro, and I, all I carried was this backpack. And I rode that bus to the very end of the line, and then I got off. And then I got on another bus and rode that bus south to the very end of the line. And I got off and I got on another bus, and I kept riding buses all the way to Texas. And I rode all the way across Texas, and then I rode all the way across Mexico, and finally I got to Guatemala. Now in Guatemala, my journey began to slow down significantly, <laughs> because in Guatemala the buses don't go as fast. They have used buses there. They take old school buses from the United States that aren't being used anymore. Buses that have been thrown out. And they somehow manage to get them to run, and they themselves travel with their buses all the way down to Guatemala, and then they fix up the engines and they decorate them. Now, Guatemala is a country that deals with a lot of uncertainty. There are earthquakes, there are landslides, there are mud flows, and so they decorate their buses, and with it, they name their buses after their wives and their daughters and their girlfriends, and they paint prayers inside the buses and little shrines to saints in hopes that this will protect them on the road. 
And as I was traveling in this bus, I often felt very uncertain as to whether or not I would get to where I wanted to go. It was very dangerous and treacherous, but also the experience of travel on a bus like this was so rich, and yet it only cost me five euro to cross all of Guatemala. That's cheaper than EasyJet. <laughs> now, I followed, and the next country was El Salvador, and then Honduras, and Honduras is a very violent country. It has the highest murder rate in the world. People told me not to go there, but it was what lay in between where I lived and the place I wanted to go. And so I traveled through Honduras on a bus, much similar to this, and in Honduras I was all right, but my friends and family were very uncertain. I was more concerned about once I got to South America, to Colombia. Colombia is also a country with a very violent reputation, with lots of murders. And not only that, the State Department in the United States published a report saying Americans should not travel to Colombia. It is very dangerous, it is very uncertain. Not only that, they said you should not travel on the bus in Colombia. <laughs> and then they said specifically you shouldn't travel on buses at night because they get attacked by drug gangs and by narco-terrorists and by bandits. They surround the bus. Actually, what they do is they, they throw a log across the road, and the bus comes along and hits it, and it breaks the axle, and the bus is forced to stop, and it's surrounded, and often they will either rob the people in the bus or take them hostage for ransom, or they will simply kill everyone on the bus. It's a, it's a scary country. It was. It's much better now. So here I was in Colombia, traveling on a bus at night, by myself, on my way to Bogota, and I fell asleep, and around 4 o'clock in the morning, wham, we hit something. I felt the front of the bus drop, and we rolled to the side of the road. The engine stopped. It was pitch black. It was totally silent. Everyone was terrified. The driver was frightened, didn't move. After about three minutes of nobody moving, nobody saying anything, somebody began to cry, and I got up, and I opened the door, and I stepped off the bus. I think as a foreigner, I was ignorant, and I realized that I couldn't really comprehend the real danger that lay outside. But I stepped out into the dark. I couldn't see anything. And I started walking along, feeling my way. Now, I didn't have a flashlight, but I had my camera. I worked for National Geographic, had my camera, took it out, and flash, and then looked at the screen, black. And I kept on doing that. I would walk, I would take a picture, flash, and then I would look at the screen. And suddenly, my feet hit something. It was warm. Flash. I took a picture and looked at it. We hit a cow. I was relieved. I went back to the bus. I told the bus driver, we've hit a cow. He was relieved. He started laughing. He told the whole bus. They all started laughing. We all got off the bus. Some people took naps under the tree. We watched the sunrise. People made picnics. It was a joyful travel experience. <laughs> but life is like this. We desire certainty, but we're traveling in uncertainty. And suddenly we depend on technology, like my camera, to find our way, to illuminate our path. And only then, when we have certainty, are we allowed to relax and enjoy the experience. Now, my trip to Antarctica was very uncertain. It was not smooth at all. Uh, once I was in the Andes going along, and this huge boulder fell from a cliff and smashed the truck right in front of us. If it had been two seconds later, it would have been our bus. I watched this all from the front seat of the bus with horror, and fortunately, we were able to get out and save the two people in this truck and get them out, and we were able to move all the rocks and clear the road. But this frightened me because of the uncertainty. It was like a cartoon, a giant boulder falling and destroying the vehicle in front of us. In the Altiplano in Peru, uh, we're at 5,000 meters high, it's very high, the air is very thin, the tires expand and they pop. And so we pop two of our tires at 5,000 meters altitude. But I was grateful for the experience, because while I was in the bus, I wasn't really traveling, I was just kind of dozing. And suddenly, fate would have it that I would stop and have a tour of this magnificent landscape that most people will never ever get to see, and that I will remember forever. In Bolivia, we had to deal with 
floods. And the floods in Bolivia, when it rains, all the roads, not, none of them are paved, and so they just turn into rivers of mud. And when this happened, we, the passengers, were expected to get the bus out of the mud. So I would get up to my waist in mud and push with all the other passengers. And this happened not once, but about five times when I was in Bolivia on five different buses. And it became part of the journey, but this was traveling with uncertainty. At this time, when I was covered with mud, I thought, I will never get to Antarctica. However, despite all of the problems along the way and all of the uncertainty, I traveled 16,000 kilometers by bus after 40 days and 40 nights and 40 buses as it came to be. I made it to Ushuaia at the southernmost tip of South America. It's the southernmost city in the world. And from there, I boarded a boat. And two days later, I reached Antarctica. Now, this was not a magnificent feat. There are people who have done far more impressive things. There are travelers who've done far more magnificent journeys. But for me, this was a personal dream. It's something that I wanted, and I was able to achieve it by simply traveling simply. And when I got there, when I finally reached Antarctica, it meant so much more to me because I had traveled overland across half the Earth to get there, and I was filled with wonder for my journey, but also for this place. And Antarctica really is a wonderful place. It is like a different planet. It is so extraordinary. And it filled me with wonder. Now, this concept of wonder is so important. It's in our human natures. Just watch a baby. A baby has wonder. A baby is an explorer in the truest sense of the word, because they are there in their very uncertain world. They don't know if they're going to be fed today. They don't know who is going to take care of them. They hope, but they don't know they're uncertain. And yet every day, they're out there touching. They're using their mouths and their fingers to explore things. They do very dangerous things in hopes of exploration and discovery. And this sense of wonder is crucial. Unfortunately, efficiency and technology is killing our sense of wonder, which is the very thing that made us want to travel in the first place. Today, travel is almost entirely predictable because tourism is a business. We can look at the Eiffel Tower on our internet, and we can see 500,000 pictures of the Eiffel Tower, so that when we finally go to Paris and see the Eiffel Tower for ourselves, we aren't experiencing the Eiffel Tower. We're comparing it to everything that technology has told us about this. We can book ourselves into a hotel and read 100 reviews written by people who've slept in the same bed that we are going to sleep in. We can even get weather forecasts for the next 10 days. This means that we have lost something. We have lost something from the experience of travel. I'll give you an example. When I got to Antarctica, I had a piece of technology, I had my camera, and I had a very special lens on it that let me get right up close so I could be this close to the animals and get close-up pictures of the penguins, which is something that I wanted. By having this lens, I had the certainty of getting that close-up shot. But by focusing so much on my technology, I missed a real-life encounter with a penguin, which is something that I will never be able to get back again. I'll give you another example, is that of airplanes. All of us fly all of the time. Airplanes are efficient. They're far more efficient than a painted school bus in Guatemala. How many people here have flown across the Atlantic? More than once. It's so easy. It takes seven, eight hours, and we cross the ocean from one side, from Europe to North America and back again. Now, how many of you have been to Greenland? This is Greenland. Greenland is a beautiful country. The nature there is staggering. It is a wonderful place. The efficiency of air travel allows us to jump continents so easily. But in the process, we have skipped Greenland. We have skipped many places. And this is a problem that I see with travel today. I feel like it's possible to gain certainty through technology and maintain wonder. These things are not opposites. The real opposites in the world, the opposite to wonder, is terror. 
And unfortunately, we live in a day and age that is defined by terror. It defines the way we travel. Right now, we are being taught to be afraid of everything. We are afraid in America of our nail clippers. We are afraid of the person checking us to see if we have nail clippers. We are afraid of our shampoo bottles. Are they too big? Are they too small? We've created this elaborate system to minimize the unexpected uncertainties of terrorism. And yet, have we conquered terror? No, we, we haven't. In fact, I think we're more afraid now. The only antidote to terror is trust. And the way that we gain trust is through travel. Taking a bus, taking public transportation halfway around the world taught me to trust total strangers. I was at the mercy of strangers all the time. Now, there are villains out in the world. There are evil people who do evil things to one another. But they are the minority, thank goodness. Most people are wonderful and trustworthy, and travel teaches us this constantly. And this is an important process for us even today. This is why totalitarian governments always try to control travel. It's the first thing they do, because by controlling travel, they can keep a society in an infantile state. This is why I believe that travel is one of the greatest human freedoms ever. I'll say it again. Travel is one of the greatest human freedoms ever. And right now, all of us in this room are free to travel. Today, I create digital narrative. What that means is I'm out there traveling and writing everything in real time. Now, traditionally, writers and travelers and explorers have written travel literature as memoir in the past tense. I'm writing it in the present tense, which means I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just writing. I'm telling the story as it happens. Now, for writers, this is a very frightening endeavor because we like to control the story. We like to control. We want it to have a happy ending for all of you. But what I found in this job that I have, writing travel narrative in real time, is that as long as I'm telling the truth, as long as I'm sharing the experience exactly as it's happening, this story is so much better than one that I could dream up of or try to control. We all know that the best stories are the true stories. This is like life. All of us are writing our lives in the present tense right now. We want to control the story. We want to add certainty to it. But if we do that too much, not only do we delete the sense of wonder that we have about our lives, but maybe we cancel out another possibility, another discovery that is far more invigorating and enlightening and perfect for us individually. My message is very simple. We need to plan less. Don't be a tourist in your life taking pictures as it happens. Instead, we need to travel. Don't be tourists, travel more, plan less. Just because we can fly doesn't mean we always have to fly. Sometimes in life we should take the bus and go slowly and enjoy and embrace every discovery as it comes to us. I traveled the most inefficient way possible and it took me exactly where I wanted to go. Kusunum.